And I believe that here in America, our success should depend not on accident of birth, but the strength of our work ethic and the scope of our dreams. That's what drew our forebears here. That's how the daughter of a factory worker is CEO of America's largest automaker. How the son of a barkeep is Speaker of the House. How the son of a single mom can be president of the greatest nation on earth. That was former President Barack Obama discussing the significance of expanding economic opportunities during his 2014 State of the Union address. It was written by his former chief speechwriter, Cody Keenan, who served in that role from 2013 to 2017. And joining me now is Cody Keenan. Cody is also the author of Grace, President Obama, and 10 Days in the Battle for America. Cody, thank you so much. It must be chilling hearing that, those words again. What is it? Walk us through the process. All White Houses are different, but what is it like, and how does a White House come up with an intention? Is it a single idea to get across? Is it a feeling? Um, how, what's the process like? Yeah, you know, Sam, like any other speech, we would sit down at the top and say, what's the story we want to tell? And then unlike any other speech, somebody comes by and drops off 50 policy proposals that you have to stick into that story. Um, but it's really an opportunity to tell the country, you know, it's your biggest audience of the year. It's people tuning in who might not pay attention to politics on a daily basis. And you get to tell them where we are, you know, where we've been, where we are, and where we get to go. Uh, so it's a really big opportunity you don't want to let pass by. And is that the general structure of these things as they go, is, uh, is sort of past, present, future? Yeah, they do become a little predictable. I mean, I'll admit, we sat down at the top of every process each year and said, let's be the ones who do something different this time. But inertia sort of catches up with you. Cabinet secretaries are pestering you to put their ideas in the speech. And, you know, by the end, by today, it's like when you're a speechwriter, it's like driving a car 200 miles an hour downhill with no doors, windows, or seatbelts. You're just trying to keep the entire thing together. But explain, Cody, why it's important for a cabinet secretary to squeeze in a little sentence there in, in the speech that you're working on. Yeah, it, it does invigorate an entire department to just have a line. I mean, this is something that people could devote their entire lives to, a certain policy proposal. And then for the President of the United States to mention on the biggest stage, it just infuses it with purpose and excitement. But I, we always told people, look, if we don't put this in the speech, please don't take that as uh, evidence that it's not important. You know, as a speechwriter, one of the worst things someone can tell you is you have to put this in the speech or else such and such group will get angry. That's just lousy speech writing. But it's a very difficult thing to balance uh, all these competing interests while still trying to tell a coherent story. And how does it differ when you're telling a story, or I should say, when your audience is a divided Congress? Yeah, it is different. That clip you, you put at the top, I, I, I was proud of that one because, you know, it, it was low-hanging fruit to make John Boehner cry. He cried a lot. That's just who he was. Um, but to do that sort of grace note at the top of a speech where you do have a divided Congress goes a long way. You always want to get caught trying. I think, you know, people say they want unity. The country wants unity. It's this elusive thing. And I'll give Biden's speechwriters some air cover here. There is no clever turn of phrase or story that guarantees unity in the country. But little grace notes like that can go a long way to show you that you're trying. Because you're showing and not telling. You're not using the word unity. You're actually displaying it. Yeah. And, you know, one thing Biden has is he's actually got a track record of getting bipartisan bills through the past two years, more than his predecessors. So he's got something he can point to. And it's sort of core to his being. You know, one, one thing about him being around for so long is you just don't change in terms of wanting to be bipartisan. He's gotten a lot of flack from the left for it. So it, I think it's something that people understand about him. Would you have any advice for the Biden team tonight? Well, it's a little late, but, you know, would need any advice for them? I, I hope they're done. Uh, but but what, what I'll say is nothing drove me crazier than somebody on TV saying, here's what the Biden people need to say. So uh, I hope they actually savor this moment. You know, I, I do miss the intensity and energy of game day as much as I don't miss writing the speech. So I hope they get to kick back and, and be proud of what they've done. You know, one thing that's really not about the speech, but in terms of just the internal structure of a White House, what's the way in which a speech focuses the mind of an entire administration in terms of priorities, getting everybody on the same page? Does it have a real benefit that we never see when we're doing the theater review that we lapse into? Yeah, I mean, this really is the hardest speech to do because you want any speech to tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And like I said before, you know, somebody comes by and drops off, here's all the policies we need to hit on your desk. 
So you need to come up with some sort of narrative, some sort of organizing structure so that it doesn't sound like a laundry list. Um, and President Obama and I always joke, you know, on game day, look, the beginning and the end are great. The middle part's fine. And the middle part was the one that always had all those policy proposals in it. <laughs> All right, Cody Keenan, thank you. The book is Grace, President Obama in 10 Days in the Battle for America.